So today we're going to be talking about our third type of market structure, which is an oligopoly. So this is a market structure in which a small number of the keyword here is interdependent. firms compete against one another. So the biggest, you know, takeaway from this chapter, what I want you guys to understand is the concept of interdependence or the idea that every action a f firm within an oligopoly does has a direct impact on another firm in the all oligopoly. So before we kind of get started, what we're going to talk about is really a one useful tool that's used to identify um, an oligopoly is the four firm concentration ratio. So what that is, this is a, um, a metric that's used to um, determine whether or not essentially there are a small number of firms controlling a certain industry. And so um, what the actual ratio is, it's the fraction of an industry sales accounted for by it's for largest firms. So essentially, if that four firm concentration ratio is larger than 40%, it tends to indicate that there would be an oligopoly in that industry. And so I can give several examples of kind of ones that if you actually looked at them, they would actually be um, oligopolies. One would be um, the cigarette industry, um, another would be, you know, beer, aircrafts, and automobiles. So now let's talk about what are the main characteristics of an oligopoly. So we've talked about the characteristics of a perfectly competitive industry, a monopolistically competitive industry, and now let's talk about oligopolies. With oligopolies, um, there are a small number of firms. There are barriers to entry. So remember, barriers of entry, barriers to entry are anything. that keeps new firms from entering an industry where the firms are making economic profits. So when we're also talking about barriers to entry, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing that I do want to talk about, one of the most important barriers to entry is economies of scale. So what economies of scale are, that's a situation when a firm's long run average costs fall as the firm increases output. When long run average costs fall as the firm increases output. So when we think about this, we can think about how 
um, kind of going back to um, big companies such as Ford talking about automobiles, um, they are able to capitalize on having a large production, large production plants um, around the U.S. And so that actually enables them to decrease their long run average costs as they're increasing output. The last characteristic we want to talk about is homogeneous or differentiated products. So remember, perfectly competitive firms, they produced homogeneous products um, that were all the same. Monopolistically competitive firms produced differentiated products through um, branding and marketing and advertising. But with an oligopoly, you can either have homogeneous or differentiated products. So an oligopoly I identified in one of my Smith papers, my student managed investment fund papers, was um, the chocolate industry in the US. So this was mainly controlled by, at the time, Hershey and Nestle. Um, and so they were producing differentiated products to a degree. But um, one of the most famous oligopolies would be OPEC, um, which is an oil cartel. And so those, they are um, producing homogeneous product oil. So another thing that we want to think about um, when it comes to oligopolies is the idea of the kink demand curve theory. So what that is, that's actually the idea that firms face a dual demand curve. for a product based on reactions of other firms to changes in price. So here, Remember, this kind of goes back to the main idea that we talked about um, regarding oligopolies, which was the interdependence between all of the companies and firms that are within an oligopoly. So with a kinked demand curve, what, ha what that looks like is we have our price and we have quantity, and then we have our demand curve that's initially at this slope, but then it hits a point in which it drops off steeper and so essentially what happens is as one firm adjusts their price downward the other firms have to follow suit so you're so since there's interdependence between all of um, the firms there's a small number of them in the market structure they're going to actually have to adjust um their prices based on what other firms are doing to their price. So there are actually a couple more reasons that oligopolies exist. One of them is ownership of a key input. So what that means essentially is if control of a key input is held by one or a small number of firms, it's going to be difficult for additional firms to enter. So we want to think about the idea of natural resources, minerals, things like that that are used in production. Another reason is due to government imposed barriers. So what happens is governments may grant exclusive rights to a certain industry um, made up of one or a small number of firms. Examples of those include occupational licensing and then patents. So we want to think about government granted exclusive rights. 
patents, things like that. So now that we've kind of talked about the characteristics of an oligopoly, also kind of some reasons why they exist, um, we're now going to transition into our second section of this chapter where we'll be talking about game theory. So essentially, economists use game theory to analyze oligopolies. What game theory is, it's the study of how people make decisions in situations in which attaining their goals depends on their interactions with others. So this kind of ties back into the idea where we talked about oligopolies being made up of interdependent firms. And that's why it's really important to, to remember that key idea of they're interdependent their actions affect the actions of others. Their price level decisions affect the pr price level of other firms. And so with game theory, we're actually kind of dis discussing the study of how you make decisions when your actions are directly affecting that of your competitors. So game theory itself was actually developed fairly recently in the 1940s and was advanced by mathematicians, economists, and other social scientists. And what they did was actually come up with three characteristics that are common to all games. The first of those being the rules that determine what actions are allowable. The second of these are the actual strategies that players employ to obtain their objectives in the game. So these are the strategies that players use to obtain their objectives in the game. And then finally, we have our payoffs. So these are the results of the interactions among the player's strategy. You can kind of also think about these as the payoff is the profit a firm earns as a result of how its strategies interact with other firms' strategies. So you see here what we have shown is what's called a payoff matrix. And I just went ahead and defined it for you over on the side. A payoff matrix is a table that shows the payoffs that each firm earns um, from every combination of strategies by the firms. So here you can see um, our two uh, players in the game are Spotify and Apple. And so those are our players. And then as far as strategies go, we have two options. Spotify, um, this is kind of referring to streaming services. So Spotify can either price at $9.99 a month or $14.99 a month and vice versa with Apple they can either price at $9.99 or $14.99 so we see our two strategies and then as far as payoffs go you can see um, we've got our our profit for each um, company within the boxes and so when it comes to actually looking at a payoff matrix um, you know each firm can choose their own business strategy obviously they want to um, maximize profit so usually that's kind of their their goal that they have in mind um, and this is a very simplified uh, matrix um, 
So here you can kind of see, I'm just gonna walk you through as if you were a Spotify in this case. So um, suppose you're Spotify in this game, how would you play? So if Apple is charging um, $14.99 a month, then you're gonna earn $10 million in profit if you charge $14.99 as well. Um, but you could earn $15 million if you lowered your price and charged $9.99. So now if we look at Apple, if Apple decides to charge $9.99, um, you would earn $5 million in profit by charging $14.99, and you would only earn... 7.5 million in profit if you charge 9.99. So you're going to prefer to charge 9.99 in this case because it doesn't matter what Apple does, um that's what's going to be best for you. So what we call that is the dominant strategy. So the dominant strategy is a strategy that is best for the firm no matter what strategy the other firm uses. So we see here in this case Spotify's dominant strategy was to charge $9.99. So now if we look at Apple's perspective, if we're Apple, how would we play? So looking at Spotify, if Spotify were to charge $14.99, Apple would earn $10 million in profit by charging $14.99. But they could earn $15 million in profit if they charge $9.99. So we're going to prefer to charge $9.99. So if we look again at Spotify, if Spotify is charging $9.99, um, Apple's only going to earn $5 million in profit if they charge $14.99, but they would earn $7.5 million if they charge $9.99. Again, you're going to prefer $9.99. So in this case, both Apple and Spotify's dominant strategy is to charge $9.99. So economists actually refer to this situation with Spotify and Apple as the prisoner's dilemma. So the prisoner's dilemma is a situation in which pursuing the dominant strategy in this case, charging $9.99 for both Spotify and Apple, results in non-cooperation. That leaves everyone worse off. So since Apple and Spotify can't collude and collaborate to agree to charge a high price, see if they both had charged $14.99, they both would have been earning $10 million in profit. Since they can't do that, what they do is they'll both charge the lower price, which leaves them both only earning $7.5 million in profit. So that's the idea of non-cooperation that's occurring. So the name of this actually kind of comes from 
uh, a problem in which, you know, two suspects are arrested by the police for a crime. So we can, we can kind of use Bonnie and Clyde as the classic American criminal couple example. They are famous for their bank robberies during the Great Depression. So although they were actually killed, we're going to pretend like they were captured and placed in separate interrogation rooms. So we can set up our payoff matrix in the corner over here. So we're going to have Bonnie and then we're going to have Clyde. We're going to have our payoff matrix. So um, we have our two players, Bonnie and Clyde, and then we need to identify our strategies. So our strategies both can either confess or not confess. So this is going to be confess. C for confess, N, C for not confess. And then as far as their actual payoffs, or in this case consequences, we're going to see that if they both confess, um, they're going to get five years in jail apiece. However, if one confesses and the other doesn't confess, then the person who confesses will get 10 years and the one who doesn't confess is gonna get off scotch-free. They're not gonna actually get any um, years in jail. So in this case, Clyde would be getting zero years and Bonnie would be getting 10 years. Again, one's confessing, one's not confessing. 10 years, zero years. And then we have the situation in which they, if they both didn't confess, then they would both only get one year. Okay, so Essentially, since both of them can't collaborate again, they're both going to end up confessing. So they, essentially, in this case, their dominant strategy would be to confess, um, which ends up being worse off for both of them because they would both get um, five years instead of if they would be able to collaborate they would both agree not to confess and only get one year each so um this video um you can access using this link actually explains that situation and kind of game theory overall it's a crash course video in a little bit um more detail so we're not going to be testing over sequential games and business strategy. So um, if you take industrial organization um, with Dr. Hoffman, he actually goes into a lot more depth on, on game theory and all of the math behind it. But, so we're not gonna really get into the sequential games. But the last thing I wanna cover um, is the Porter's Five Forces model. Um, this is actually can be used um, to analyze the overall competition in an industry. Um, and so essentially it's going to have five different things we're going to look at, um, you know, competition or rivalry um, from existing firms in the industry. We have threat of new entrants. We've got competition from substitute goods and services. And then bargaining power of buyers and bargaining power of suppliers. So um, this was actually um, created by a guy from Harvard Business School. Um, and so it's going to be called your Porter's Five Forces. And what that actually looks like um, it's gonna actually, you're gonna rank each of these from a scale of one to five. And the actual graphic is going to look something like this. 
so it's a pentagon. And then you'll have, at the tip of each one, you'll have um, rivalry, threat of new entrance, bargaining, power of customers, threat of substitutes, and then we've got bargaining power. of suppliers. So we got a pentagon that has each of those um, five um, forces at the tips. And so once, once they're ranked, um, you essentially can create a model that will, you know, identify which ones are um, high threats, low threats, very low threats, moderate threats, um, etc. So what I'll do is actually upload an example of a Porter's Five Forces that I actually helped create um, with the CFA team to kind of show you in a little bit more depth. Essentially, competition from existing firms that's looking within the industry itself, the firms that are already um, working, and you know making a profit and then as far as threat of new entrants those are the ability of another company to enter that market you're looking at barriers to entry competition from substitute goods or services um we want to look at essentially whether or not um you know does this company specifically have um more or less competition you want to look at domestic and international and then we have our bargaining power of both buyers and sellers that's kind of looking at where it is in the supply chain so we talked a lot about um you know the movie theater industry and um obviously one of the key the key things for that would be um, competition from substitute goods and services, talking about the streaming services. Um, we want to think about, too, as far as threat of new entrants. Um, you know, within the movie theater industry, there's not a lot of new entrants necessarily because it's a highly capital-intensive industry. There's more um, mergers and acquisitions going on. So, um, But I will upload a example of one in the oil and gas industry that y'all can look at so that about sums up oligopolies overall really key takeaways that um i want to focus on or want you to focus on would be the ideas of um interdependence so within within all the um within all the firms and um, also looking at kind of the interactions within the firms. Essentially, everything one firm does affects the others directly.